So welcome to our boot camp mentorship program. Uh, my name is uh, Bishop Paul Munyeri, and uh, I want to take us through in this church, Pefas Yokimao Community Church, uh, through an introductory session of what I'm calling boot camp mentorship program. And today being the first day, we'll be doing an introduction where I shall give you an overview of what we'll be covering in the area of mentorship. And we shall be trying to answer like about three questions. Number one, we shall be asking ourselves, what is this boot camp mentorship program? The what? And then we shall also be covering the why the program. And thirdly, we shall be also be asking ourselves, how will the program be conducted? Uh, among other questions. So those three questions, I will ensure that by the time that we end the program today, we should take like an hour, uh, we shall have been able to answer those three questions. Uh, when you look at the way God has worked with the people, as an example, the children of Israel, when they are coming to the Canaan land from, uh, from Egypt, in many a times, God kept talking to them as they progressed in the journey. And as a church, we've been here for the last seven and a half years, and I seem to be sensing that God is telling us that it is the time to go to the next level. God has brought us this far, and he is now calling us so that we can be able to break camp and go to the next level. When you look at the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verse 6 to verse number 8, Moses was reminding the children of Israel by telling them, The Lord our God said to us at Holeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in the Aramba. And then down there he says, See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land. God has been speaking to me many, many times and for many years. But in the last about two months, the Lord, in a way, has spoken to me so often uh, in a way that is showing that he, God is up to something. And that is why I believe that God wants us to go to the next level and I'll be telling you. For instance, in the month of April 2021 20, alone, on the 11th of April, the Lord spoke to us and said about this church. The Lord speaks to many other, I mean, uh, many other times about other things, but I'm concentrating uh, more on what the Lord has been saying about the church. He said, my house shall be a house of prayer, teaching of my word, and the fellowship. I have chosen this church to be my dwelling place and to be a house of prayer. That was on the 11th of April 2021. And then on the 17th, less than a, a week later, the Lord spoke to me and said, my servant Munyeri, I have chosen you and through you I'll do great things that have never been seen before. Then a few days later, on the 29th of April, 2020, I mean 2021, he said, Munyeri, I have called you to be my servant. Munyeri, ask you for whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. And it was interesting that on that particular day, the Lord repeated many times, about five times, the same thing. Uh, before we began this church in the year 20, uh, 2013, God spoke to me many things. And he told me that he would want to establish a church here of thousands and thousands of people. Thousands. Before we began this church. And the Lord has spoken that time that when we begin this church, in the course of time, there would come a time when God, when miracles and wonders 
will be happening in this church or in the church that we were to establish that time. And uh, because of all what the Lord has been saying and the direction that the Lord has been taking us, my prayer and my desire is that the Lord use us to believe God, to establish a church in this place before many years are, uh, are done of over 10,000 people. That's my prayer and my desire. That the Lord would give us a church of over 10,000 members. And that will require us to build a big sanctuary, uh, maybe among the biggest sanctuaries in town, in Nairobi. And my desire is that we shall build one of the most magnificent cathedrals in Nairobi. And what comes to mind is that we need to do everything that we do that would be world-class. World-class facilities, world-class uh, operations. And what I used to say uh, when we began the church here, there was a statement I always used to say that we want to create or to have a church where we create an irresistible environment in our church, Pefas Yokimau Community Church. A place where whenever one would visit once, they would never be able to resist to come back. And for that to happen, there is a lot that would need to be put uh, on the ground. They, we would need to really prepare ourselves to do that. And in preparation for that kind of a growth and progress, then I have decided that I would want to train and prepare and equip some people that I'll be calling kind of uh, a number of names, maybe like workers. That is not a, 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 a title that we have, we have been used to using in our church here. Workers, liberals, ministers, leaders. Uh, but mostly, maybe we shall adopt the word workers. We have a team of workers or a team of ministers, people that would be trained uh, so that we can be able to work together to make sure that we can fulfill what the Lord has been saying all this time. And one of the things that really I would desire to do is to have a people or individuals who would be uh, willing to really get to understand what my vision is and people that would be uh, ready to strictly follow the vision as God uh, will continue to unfold to us. Knowing that I'm the vision bearer and God is speaking to me and God is showing me the direction just the same way you would see many other leaders, especially in the Bible, people like Moses, where God would speak to one individual and then he would instruct the individual the direction the group would take. And so I want to, uh, to train, equip uh, the, 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 the people that will join this uh, program. And one of the key things that I will really be uh, looking for or desiring to see is having a united team of like-minded people. There before, I think before I became very a bit, quite a bit experienced in the ministry, I thought it was very easy to have like-minded people in a group. And I think the, the, the older I am I'm becoming, and the more I'm uh, continuing to have more experience, the more I am realizing that it is not easy to have people who will be of the same mind and people that will be united. And unfortunately, sometimes or most of the time, the things that divide people, the things that make people not to be like-minded, most of the time are very small things very small, that make people even to be surprised if you tell them uh, what could be dividing the people. 
And so I'll be looking for a team, individuals, who really will be willing to capture the vision. People will be knowing the direction uh, that God will be wanting to take us and people who will really desire to be part of uh, this big work that God wants to do. And they'll be willing to submit themselves to the vision that God will be giving us or has already given us but will continue to unfold. The other thing that I want to share with us is about the objectives. What is the objective? What, what really do we want to achieve in this? The objectives of the boot camp mentorship program. There are several, and uh, I'm not sure that I have exhausted all of them by now, but uh, I have a few. Number one objective is to upgrade the standards of our church ministry and operations. Yes, we've been here for the last seven years, and we've been doing well, but I feel that a time has come when now we we'll want to begin to look on ways on how we can do what we are doing in a better way. We upgrade the standards of what we, uh, we do. And we want to strive to have higher standards of excellence in all that we do. We we'll want to have uh, especially the team that will be with us uh, to help and guide the rest of the church on how to demand of ourselves to begin doing things with a higher level of commitment and devotion to God's work. Where we tell ourselves that we can no longer in any area, in any department, in any area of operation, we will not allow ourselves to perform in a mediocre way. We tell mediocrity no from our operations and from our church. And as I mentioned, we should uh, strive to attain world-class performance. World-class. So that if people will be looking for a place where they could come to learn, whether they are coming from any continent of, uh, of the world, they can be able to come to Pefas Yokimao Community Church and the fact that here we are doing things uh, that are at a world-class level of excellence and standard. That will be what we shall be doing in Sunday school, among the youth, among the teenagers as we minister to them, the women, the priests at worship. Uh, or if it is like the school that we are having here, uh, if it is like the Hope Center that we have here, in all our operations, we strive to attain world-class performance. That's my desire. And even finally, when we begin to build facilities, especially permanent facilities, again, we strive also, like the sanctuary that we shall be building, we build a world-class facility. And that is why we are talking about boot camp. Boot camp, why I'm using that word, is so that we could have a boot camp kind of a mentality. A mentality where the people that will be in this program, we will kind of go through a rigorous kind of a training, just the same way you will fight like the paramilitary people like in the NYS. They go to a, for a training, what they would call a boot camp, where they go through a rigorous kind of a, a, a training that would really stretch them to become the best in the areas all in whatever uh, they are supposed to be. And so uh, that's, that's the number one objective, upgrading the standard of our church ministry and operation. Number two objective is spiritual formation and the development. We would want to develop workers and leaders who will, in a bigger way, be spiritually mature. I know when we talk of spiritual maturity is a relative uh, thing uh, or term to use, but we want to see people that can take full responsibility. People who grow in the Lord, they grow in their knowledge of the ministry, they grow in the skills and the knowledge of how ministry is done in a way that they can be able to take uh, responsibility without a lot of supervision. Uh, because if the church grows and then we become many, then 
uh, supervision, we would need uh, key leaders who would not need a lot of supervision. And for this to happen, we will, through this training, we shall be taking ourselves and one another through what I would call spiritual disciplines. To get really to spiritual maturity requires going through kind of spiritual disciplines. People like, I mean, are things like demanding of ourselves and giving accountability to one another on what we do in terms of reading the word of God in a daily basis, prayer, fasting, and uh, other things that could help us uh, to, towards Christian maturity. In the same on spiritual formation and development, we'll also uh, deal with some of the deep-seated emotional and psychological issues that you find with the many people that make it difficult for people to be able to work with one another. Those are some of the things that I would call treasures of the heart. Every person, wherever you are brought up, where you are born and brought up, you find that there are issues that we go through, uh, particularly when we are quite young, and psychologists will be able to, to tell us that there are deposits of some things that make us behave the way we do. And many of us, we have gone through experiences, especially when we were young, and even maybe the various systems and belief systems where we grew up, that deposited what I'm calling the treasures of the heart that sometimes make it very difficult to work with people. There are people who went through rejection, there are people who, were, who went through uh, various kinds of abuses, molestations, either by parents, by the guardians, by their loved ones, by the teachers, by the community, the immediate community where they were go growing. And because of this, you find many people in church. They are born again, but they, are still, they still have a lot of jealousy, malice, bitterness, shyness, insecurity, pride, a sense of ungodly self-importance. You say somebody really want everybody to think they are very important more than what Paul would say. Don't carry yourself more highly than you ought to. Don't be conceited because of things like pride, sense of importance, Superiority complex, inferiority complex, and all those kind of things. Many a time in church and even in our working places, it becomes difficult to work with one another because of those deposits or both negative and particularly negative things uh, that we have gone through as we were growing up. And they begin to show, uh, to show as we relate with one another. So some, those are some of the things that we shall be trying to address. And then number three objective, and very important, is that we shall be trying to build capacity of the church workers and leaders for growth. If we shall get the kind of a growth that God is calling us to have, it will, it will be imperative that we build capacity of the leadership in the church. And this will require that we prepare people to do ministry at a higher level, as I said. And this will demand that we also help people to identify and develop uh, their talents, their giftings, to identify their areas of calling and, uh, and all that. And by building capacity, we shall be seeking to position ourselves as a church at a place that we can be able to receive what God wants us to receive. Personally, I believe that God, even before he created the, the world, he had all that every human being that he had purposed to create, to have. Everything you need, everything I need, everything the church needs, already is available in heaven. It's ready. 
But why we don't receive the things that God has promised us is simply that we are not yet ready. We have not built capacity and positioned ourselves at a level where God can release the things that we need. And sometimes we have also not asked enough. But building capacity will be very, very key in this program. Number four, and the last one that I will share uh, today, but as I mentioned, uh, maybe with the time we may still increase the number of objectives. Number four objective is develop a team of soldiers or workers. I'll be using all these words, but in this particular objective, I'm, uh, I'm emphasizing the word soldier. Build, develop a team of soldiers or workers or leaders that are ready for service. I'm using the word soldier very deliberately. Because we'll be trying to raise a team of prayer warriors, intercessors, armor bearers, servants, people that can be able to serve in the church. When you look at the life of David, and I shared this in one of the sermons recently, you find that David was a man that was called by God for a very great purpose to build the nation of Israel. He was the first key king that we see after Samuel and then King Saul comes very briefly and he didn't succeed but then David, God shows him to come and do great work of establishing the kingdom of, the, uh, of Israel. And one of the things that you discover about David is that David was a warrior. David was many things. He was a musician. He was a songwriter and composer. He was a king. Sometimes he could almost uh, operate like a priest, a prophet. Many of his psalms are prophetic by nature. But one of the things that you see about David is that David was a warrior. And one of the things that he did is that he trained other warriors. And we were seeing the other day where you could fight what they would call the mighty men of David, of war. Where you would fight one soldier, one warrior, being able to kill 300 other warriors of opposing armies. There's one that is listed who killed 800 one day in one encounter. People that David would raise would even become more powerful than himself as warriors. David was a giant killer. He trained other giant killers. And uh, when you now have a team of many warriors like that, then when they would go to war with the other nations, you would find a very small army of David being able to defeat very large and very vast armies because of the kind of a training they had gone through. So as, as a church, we need to train warriors and uh, giant killers like David. But here we will need to raise a disciplined team of leaders or warriors who know the rules of spiritual warfare. If there is one thing that is really a bother or a problem in the church is where you have soldiers, warriors, who don't know the spiritual rules of the game. And one of the things that you find in church is that you'll find in church many a time you have a battalion of soldiers who, who are fighting the enemy, but many a times they fight themselves. They fight one another. They kill one another. And when one of them is wounded, you'll find they'll be very good, many of them, to finish their wounded soldier. And they tarnish their names, they talk ill against them, they do everything, and they finish the work that the enemy began. And it becomes very easy for the devil. Many a time the devil even uh, almost takes vacation in churches. 
many churches, they do not need to be fought by the devil. They, uh, they can fight and finish themselves. But now Jesus is free. In many places like Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, when he was fighting with many armies from several nations, God would confuse the enemies and they would, fight to they would begin to fight one another at themselves and they would finish themselves without the, the Israelites or the people of Judah touching them. And many a time, this is what you see in church. People do not know the spiritual rules or spiritual warfare. My intercessor said you continue to pray and the enemy will throw scud missiles. He will throw bombs, spiritual bombs against you. And when one of you as intercessors has been a megongwa, unakuta hawa ni wadado walikuwa naomba sana, then mumoja hawa unakuta amepata mimba. Watu wana mugeukia, wana inuwa mimba. Hata tulijua. Hata tulikuwa tunaona. Ulikuwa unaona nini? Ukafanya nini? Nakupata miba, nikumanisha safari imeisha. Safari ya kweda biguni imeisha kwa sababu miba imepatikana. E, Buwana wa mungi niyambi. Mungi wa mungine ni ngumu sasa ni amua kusema hile kubwa. E, even you parents, if your daughter becomes pregnant, is that the head of life? Wale mkwa na wasi ya na wiki kama pastor Ben muombe sana. E, na naema ya mungu iwe mi. Hey, but this is what you find in church. You find these pastors. Pastor is there fighting for the church. Taking days and days to pray and to fast. And the day pastor atashikwa na shida, kanisa yot. Ye ame wapigania siku zote na siku hili anapatikana na shida. Muna mumaliza. Ata shetani anashukua vacation na nawasha mumalize pastor. Yukia jirani yako umambie makanisa tuko na ujinga mingi. Ujinga mingi ya kiroho. So, we shall be building a team of soldiers and you want a disciplined team. A team that can develop the right culture. Uh, leaders that you can build the right culture in the church. And if there is one thing that really I will be majoring in is to really try to create, we develop a new organizational culture based on the right things, the word of God and in the right way. And those will be issues like unity. Uh, unity is very key, but you'll find that is a culture that would need to be developed. The culture of appreciating people when they make good contributions towards what we are, we are doing, the work of God. Uh, when people make contributions, maybe they are leading a department or they are doing whatever they do and they do well, we should build a culture of appreciating them. But also, we overcome the culture of complaining. One of the things that I've seen in churches is where you have some people who have the spiritual gift of complaining? Sijui ni ya mungu ama ni ya shetani. Nijua kuna ma spiritual gift ingine lazima ujue hii ni ya wapi. Because it's a spiritual issue. But is it from the Holy Spirit or from the evil spirits? Complaining, fortifying. But some of these things utakuta again, they are things as we talked about, the treasures of the heart. There are people who are brought up in environments where they don't trust other people easily, where their parents waliwafunza tu kuona makosa ya watoto wengine, na hata wakikuja kwa maofisi where they work with other people, they'll always see the bad side of things. Some of them were not brought up in an environment of trust. Maybe the people they trusted most who are supposed to be the most trust of the people like their father, was not trustworthy. Their mother was not trustworthy. And so, even when they come to church, they think everybody is their father. Or their mother. Or whoever was not trustworthy, wherever they came from. 
So those are some of the things we'll try to overcome as we build a culture of trust, a culture of thanksgiving, thanksgiving to God and to people, and then a team of workers who are loyal to their leadership. Another thing I've seen that is very difficult sometimes, and that is why, like the church in Kenya, never really grows that much, is that not many people are loyal to leadership. I was thinking the other day that you look at churches in Nigeria, for instance, you can see a pastor in Nigeria with over 100,000 church members. And within that church of 100,000, there must be many people that are very, very highly gifted and talented and people that can be able to do a lot. But they have submitted themselves under the loyalty of one leader and they are willing to support the vision of one person. But not in Kenya. I've been trying to think, who, who, who is really in Kenya now is the man that really has a very big ministry. You go to other nations, Ukiuliza in America, who are the men that are shining, that are able to attract big, massive congregations? And you'll be told. But in Kenya, who is the man who can call a meeting now at Uhuru Park and a lot of people go? Who comes to your mind? I'm not sure. Which is the choir? Which is the praise team? Which is the singing team? Then can go to KICC and organize an event and attract 20,000 people. I'm not sure. We have. Go to other countries. You'll find it is there. There are teams when they go. Sasa wale tu anaenda sasa ni mtu kama Shashil. At least Shashil akienda mahali kuna jurikana ameenda. But churches, I'm not sure. What is the problem? People are not loyal. People do not like to support one another. If you want to sing in teams, within a team, kila mtu anajisikia meitwa na unakuta kila mtu ameenda kuanza yake. Nobody want to support any other person. Makanisa, unakuta kanisa doko kama hii. Imeshipuka watu na unasikia, even not in an official way, umesikia, imespread, spread na imeanzisha tu makanisa, tu kioski, tu churches, tu ingi, abayo hata shetrani haitaji, hata kutupiga, tunajipiga tuwenyewe. Hata umasikini na wapiga peke yake tu. Njoo shetrani, shetrani hata kiona kanisa iko na umasikini mingi, hata haitaji kuipiga, unaipigia nini na haina impact. But people are not able to bring resources together, have something powerful, something that can infect the communities, something that can be too big to begin doing similar things in bigger ways, in organized ways, planting churches, planning international missions, because there are resources, spiritual, intellectual, callings and giftings and uh, financial resources enough to do that. But in Kenya, many people are not loyal. And we are very good in Kenya seeing the mistakes of one another. But you go to a place like Nigeria, washirika wake wakisikia ukisema kitu wataweka wokovu pale kwanza wadil na wewe. Wakimalizana na wewe, watubu wa rudi kanisani. Lakini Kenya, watu wana kuongo wa maisikiza, ati ulisikiaji? Eh, eh, hiyo in information inasabaha huko, na wale abao huwa now closest to you, wale abao anastahidi kuwa wana kulida, they are the people who will undermine you, and they are the people who will finish you. Mutu aseme, ishindwe. We need to change our mentality and the culture. So th those are the, the, the objectives that I have listed so far, but I might add one or two. 
So that is the direction that I want us to go. But for us to understand really the picture that I have, I want to pick two examples in the Bible very quickly of people who did excellent work. And we see what was the secret behind the success and the excellence that you see them performing. And the number one person I want to take is Moses. And I don't want to share everything that Moses did, but I want to share just in the area of building the tabernacle. Moses was called by God and was told by God that God wanted him to build a place, a sanctuary, a place of worship in the desert. There's a tabernacle that would be carried from place to place. The Levites would carry it wherever they were going. And uh, we, I would want us to see how it was built. God gave Moses the vision and a dream in the, uh, on the mountain. And he was given the pattern on how this was supposed to be done. And so one key thing that you'd want to see here is God many a time, he gives one person the vision. He gives one person the dream and the pattern of what needs to be done. And so the best thing that would happen is that other people are supposed to come and find out clearly what is the pattern, what is the vision, what is the dream. What does God want done? Because God will never give to many people. And I think, again, as I mentioned, as I continue to have more and more experience, I begin to see this more. God literally has been speaking to me so much about this church, as I mentioned earlier. And the interesting thing is that God never tells me about anybody else. And many a time it's my wife that God uses to speak prophetically. My wife, by the grace of God, she has developed a prophetic ministry that is developing and growing every other day. And the interesting thing is, she is my wife and God will speak to me through her and he says nothing about her. And I'm wondering, God, si huyu ni mke wangu na tunafanya hiyo huduma pamoja. Ye, mungu hana shuhuli na ye. Anasema mwenyeri. But there are times he will say, talk to us in a plural manner. And so you'll find that visions God gives to an individual. And this is now where the challenge comes. Because when you come to church, when you are the main leader and you have many other leaders, they want to have so much say into what you do. You go to Moses, he has so many other voices speaking to him. Paka wegini wananza kuuliza. Na wewe, kwani ni mungu wana ongele? Shanga tu wewe peke yako. Wanaezu wasifiwe? Uko nyuma? Who are the people who are saying that? They were the closest, the, the high priest. The brother of Moses was the one, and the sister Miriam, the main praise and worship leader. Because But through experience, I've realized when you are the main leader, God assumes as if there is nobody else. As if he can answer. And let me tell you what I have discovered is this. Mutu apende asipende. Uwamini ya mausi amini. When God calls a main leader, the success or the failure of that work depends on that one man. Mpaka atakapodoka. And if there is anything that the people should do when you have a Moses, is to keep Moses alive. Because the one who can figure out see is the man God will use. Muko uko wengi, lakini God will not speak to, to them. Mukienda mukute hakuna shakula. Ninani mungu anatumia teremusha shakula kutoka biguni. Mukikuta hakuna maji ninani. Mbaka kina Joshua wanashidwa na wewe mungu ukwani wewe unakipedeleo unagani. Hakuna kipedeleo mungu tsi democracia. 
God does whatever he pleases. He is sovereign God. Sometimes when we are with my wife, I almost feel atanza kufikiria na wewe Mungu ananitumia kukuongelesha sana kwa nini aniongeleshei? Na kidaka kumwambia mambo yake anamwambia akiwa peke yake kwa sababu hiyo ni yake. Lakini ikiwa ni ya kanisa. If we don't learn those basics, if we don't learn those fundamentals, we cannot go far. Sorry, uh, I, uh, my intention was not to talk about that. I was to talk about Moses and the tabernacle. But that thought came because it is one of the things that we shall be talking a lot in this mentorship program. So God shows Moses the pattern and the vision. But then God tells Moses, definitely you are not the one to do the work. There are people that I have gifted to do that. And in uh, Exodus 35, verse 30 to 33, you will see God or Moses now coming and telling the children of Israel that when he was in the mountain, he spoke to Moses about one particular gentleman that God had chosen that he'd use to do most of the work that needed to be done, uh, the technical, more the technical, and this guy, Anaitwa Bezalel. So God will give you the main leader, the vision, but he's not the one necessarily who will fulfill the vision. He will come and tell the people the vision and they will be, the work will be divided among the people, but they must follow the instruction of the leader who had the instruction and the pattern, who saw the pattern and the vision. So, so Basilel, let me read for you verse 30 to that one, Exodus 35, 30 to that two, let me read for you. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and with understanding, and with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze. So, God has given this guy, or well, he has anointed him, he has filled him, some translations say, he has filled him with the spirit, some others say he has anointed him with the spirit to be able to have those three and even others, but the key abilities he was given are three. He was given wisdom, he was given understanding, and he was given knowledge. And I want us to look at those three words and we see what really, if we shall be able to achieve what God wants us to achieve in this church, what are some of the things that we need that enabled Moses to succeed and to do a very excellent tabernacle and the work that could also help us. The first word is wisdom. Many a time you'll find us using these words interchangeably, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, but they are not the same, particularly when you look at them from the original uh, language, the, he the Hebrew language. Wisdom is technical skill, technical skill in this context, to know how to do something. This is where you have a talent, definitely, Bezalel had the talent, but he had developed the talent to a higher skill, to be a higher skill. And if we shall do what God wants us to do, brethren, we will need to have men and women of wisdom, people who will have developed it to a level where it becomes technical skill to do what needs to be done in the work of God, in the church. Technical skill in all areas of our ministry. Technical skills in Sunday school. In the teenagers ministry. In the youth ministry. In the women ministry. In the men ministry. In the prison worship. Maybe choir. In sound engineering. And in all other areas that would be needing to do the ministry. 
For those that are called to preach and to teach, they need to develop technical skills on how to do it so that we do it excellently. So Bezalel had the wisdom, the technical skill to do what he had been called to do. And so we shall be encouraging and challenging us to really seek to develop technical skill to do ministry in our various areas. Number two is understanding. Understanding from the context of this passage is talking about capacity to think. This is now where in church, particularly the Pentecostal churches, you find this becoming a challenge. Many of us are professionals. We are very good in what we do in business, in our various professions. And we go into boardrooms where we discuss, we go into doing the work in a big way. But you come to church and you find that many a time you don't see a lot of thinking behind the things that we do. When you have the capacity to think, then you are able to look at a problem in, uh, in an intelligent manner. And you think in, uh, intelligently through an issue until you are able to come up with a reasonable solution. If it is the youth ministry, you give it your thoughts prayerfully until you are able to get to a level where you can say that we have a way of doing what we want to do. If it is Sunday school, if it is praise and worship, if it is our developments that we want to do, physical developments, if it is our school, if it is our hope center, we will need to engage our thinking and our creativity and innovation in a way that you'll define that we come up with the reasonable things that we are doing. And that will give us the excellence and the success that we want. When you look at the great ministries and even the great companies in the world, you will find while maybe there is anointing and the heart of God working in those ministries, to a greater extent, you'll find that what they have applied that God has given them is the capacity to think. You see, when you talk about anointing, recently I told somebody, we were, we were with in our Pepper City Center Church. I left one of the members there. And he asked me, you guys, we hear like you are doing so well in Sukimao. What has happened? And I told him, it is the grace of God. Can you know, Pastor? It's not the grace of God. The grace of God is a common denominator. A denominator in every ministry. What else are you using? Siku taku mujibu sana lakini nikajijazia, nikajua. It is what? Capacity to think. But now if you want to go to another next level, we need to engage capacity to think more. Let me ask you a question. I don't know whether you, maybe you look at the churches around and to try to learn something. In Nairobi, for instance, and even in other towns, we have like two ministries that seem to really impress me. Sitam and ICC. Those two churches, I seem to have quite a good background about them. For the last about 20, 25 years is when Sitam began to open branches. They were always at Vada Road. And Dennis White decided to begin opening churches. Many of the senior clergy there, we were either in the same Bible school, or some of them in the same class. And I know them, and I know them quite well. And one of the things I know is that even in class, they were not necessarily different than us. If it is anointing, it is not necessarily anything different. If it is ICC, even the man who began it, or who really developed it, it had been there for quite some time, but who developed Pastor Ron Somers, 
was our lecturer when I was doing my first degree. But when you look at what they are doing, those guys are doing impressive, impactful ministry in major, major ways. But when you look at why they are where they are, while the grace and the anointing, which is the common denominator, denominator is there, it is the capacity to think. So I'm inviting you to a place of beginning to think more in what we do. Because that will make all the difference. What about in the secular? What are some of the companies that really impress you? Yes, the other day, about three, four days ago, we were with my wife watching news, business news. Because here, yeah, Equator are now giving their first quarter financial results. And they said the company this year, January, February, March, first quarter of the year, they have increased their profits with 67%. <laughs> when other companies are closing shop, somebody's company has increased profitability, not revenues, not, not sales, profitability, Joe. 67%. During Corona, hey, 8.7 billion in three months. And this is a company that has barely been there 20 years. Before 2003, it was a building society. Uko Kange Mauko in the village. And in 20 years, it has Assets over a trillion Kenya shillings and in several countries of Africa. What is the difference? It is the capacity to think. No magic. No miracle. Anybody else could have done it if they used the same thinking. That is how different organizations, including churches, become when there is thinking. And so success depends on thinking behind everything. Church growth and success does not just depend on anointing. We really need it and we want to see miracles and we want to see big things happening. But there are many churches where miracles are happening but they cannot grow even beyond 100 members because the anointing is there but there are no there's no capacity to think. Mimi niko na marafiki wengi sana ma pastor. Huwa ni nahurumia sana. Na wengine nimewaita hapa. Unaita jamaa bwana. Unakuta huyu jamaa. Akikutana na shetani. Shetani anatoroka. Lakini huyu jamaa. Even to feed the family is a challenge. Unajua ni nini? Huu jamaa naomba na roho anashuka na anointing iko mingi lakini kwa kisho hakuna kitu. Na Mungu, Mungu ni wajabu. Mungu there are some principles that God has set from the foundations of the earth that he cannot go against. If you don't use your head, utakaa mahali tu mtu wa beha tumiangi akili ako. Hata uwe na anointing kiasi gani? Mamu na shanga. Huyo ni mungu. Ateni nani? Newe ukiwa na akili, uta, uta, utaeda mabo mazuri, kutegeneza pesa mingi, usipopata, ufunuo kwamba unatubu dhambi za kuenda binguni. Uta enjoy maisha ya kuwa na utajiri mingi hapa na binguni hakuna. Takini, if you choose to have a balance between the two, so that we are building a team of prayer warriors, Shetani ya kituona anatoroka. Lakini pia, tuwe na akili. Bwana hezo ya sifiwe. Eh, kwa sababu tukikosa moja, we'll suffer the consequences. Okay. Sorry, I've taken a bit of time kwa understanding. Eh? Let me go to number three. Knowledge. Dio, tusikawie sana. 
uh, I'll not take too much time. Knowledge. What is knowledge in this context? It is uh, to master something. It's to master something. It's to be a master. To have mastery of what one is doing. So our desire is that moving forward, we'll have workers, leaders in the church who are masters in what they do. They have the knowledge. People who will be masters in children ministry. People who will have master in men's ministry, in women ministry, in praise and worship. People who have the knowledge to know what they are doing in their particular area or field of ministry. And that is why we need to come together, we challenge one another so that we can develop leaders and um, workers who have the technical skills, who have the capacity to think, who have the mastery in whatever they do so that then the ministry, we can be able to do the ministry with more efficiency, with more effectiveness, with more excellence, and uh, in whatever we do, we find that we are doing ministry in an intelligent way to be able to receive, position ourselves at a place where we can receive the promises and the blessings of God. Brethren, God can promise you anything because he desires to give you. But if you do not position yourself, if you do not build your capacity, Utakatu at one level. So God has spoken major things, but it will take building capacity and getting ourselves positioned to be able to get what God is saying. So that is the first example of Moses. He was able to build a very excellent tabernacle, but the things that were behind what he was doing was the wisdom, technical skill, the understanding, capacity to think, and then knowledge, which is the mastery of what they were doing. That is how they built the tabernacle. Number two example is King Solomon. King Solomon, uh, I don't know who has a Bible who can, uh, who can read for us. First Kings 10 verse 1 to 5. Or somebody can give me my Bible. Anthony, give me my Bible. I read for you guys. First Kings 10, verse 1 to verse number 5. King Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. Thank you, thank you, Anthony. And this is what the Bible says. I want to pick an incident in the life of King Solomon that would help us to see how did he use his wisdom to do things in an excellent way that we can borrow from. And uh, the incident that I'm borrowing is a visit. King Solomon used to have visitors. Kings and queens from all over the world would visit Jerusalem to hear the wisdom of Solomon and to see the wisdom of Solomon at work. Remember God had said that would give him wisdom and knowledge. And when you look at him, you also see he had a lot of understanding. So we have the Queen of Sheba coming all the way from Africa, I guess Africa, I mean uh, Ethiopia, to visit Jerusalem. And this is what it says if you could read just the first uh, five verses. First Kings 10 Verse 1 to verse number 5, it says, When the king of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test, note that, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very large caravan with the camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. 
Verse number four, very important. When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, the food on his table, the sitting of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cup bearers, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. Some other translations say she was left without spirit. Akawa ni kama mutu amefaint. Have you ever visited some places and you saw some things mpakazi na kuwasha ukiwa karibu ata kupumua unasikia? She was overwhelmed, left without spirit by seeing what the man had done. Seeing the palace, seeing the temple, listening to this man. And she said, is this a human being? Is this on earth that I can see what I'm seeing in Jerusalem? And I would want to share a little bit on what the Bible is telling us here. And I try to expand <clears throat> on when we know how the, 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 the things were happening in the palace. Now, I try to put some meat in the few words that we have been told of what this queen did. When she visited, what happened is that King Solomon decided to make a royal banquet for her. And now, whatever is being explained here is what she saw in the palace and also during the banquet. And the first thing that she saw was the structures, the house, the palace that King Solomon had built. The place was so immaculately built that she could not, she, she was so impressed. And that is why I'm saying that if we shall have the things that we have seen with Moses, even us, at our own, in our own way, we can be able to build a world-class cathedral and facilities and ministry in Siokimau. If it, if it ever happens in any other place in the world, then it can happen. And when it comes to structures and building, I know many of us are a bit, uh, a bit young, many others are a bit older, kidogo. But one of the things that you'll see is that people will always assess you and gauge you by what you build. And this will be in terms of building organizations and much more building physical houses. People would want to see something that you have built. And what you build and how you do it will demonstrate your wisdom. Unaweza tu kutabia kwa mtu uangalie nyumba yake, uangalie church yake, umuangalie hivi, unaweza kumpima huyu mtu akili yake inafika wapi? Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Ama namna gani? Eh, hey, una visit tu kwa mtu namna hii, unamwangalia tu, unampima, unamweka kwa mesani. Unajua huyu mtu akili yake imefika wapi? And in Sokima we would want that we do things that are well thought. Things that we do, whether it is toilets, whether it is offices, whether it is the sanctuary, whatever we do in Siokimao, we would want to do it in a way that when people come, after we have gone a little bit further, they can be able to tell that here are people who think. People who have the wisdom, people who have the knowledge, the understanding of what they do. I don't know whether you have ever experienced this, that you go to places where you expect so much, and you, f you find, you go to a place, for instance, for you to locate a toilet. It's a public place, and for you to locate a toilet, it takes you time. And you're wondering, those people who are building this house, why are they making it so difficult? But the thing is, people did not give enough thought to thinking what they are doing. Sometimes you go to hotels and to locate some things, 
I don't know whether you have ever gone to hotels and you get very frustrated. Very expensive hotel and you cannot even get an electric socket. Unataka kushaji simu. Umelipa hotel 10,000. Na socket ya 50 bob. Hakuna. And you're ordering, waliweka hii mambo na hii, hii, hizi, 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 very expensive tiles. Na vitu zigine zina hangu huku vizuri sana na makate ni kubwa kubwa. Lakini hakuna small gadgets. Unaanza asa kukweda kwa reception ukiuliza wa kueke simu hapo ichanji. You're ordering, I paid 5,000, 10,000 and you could not provide this. Those are some of the things that show that really building a house and structures is not so much about the money necessarily. It is the thinking, the wisdom behind what you do. When we come and look at what you have built, one of the areas that can really tell us your thoughts and your thinking is your toilet. Yes, usinueke tu kwa sitting room ni kubalie ni ingie kwa toilet ni nione kuna kuanga na mna gani many people kuambia na weza ingia the small place lazima mutu wa kuongoze aende pengine angalie kama apanguse panguse kidogo kwa sababu maybe kuna kitu wa jaka vizuri ama odoe kalai kwa jia ama vitu kama hizo sasa unaona huyu ujama yeye akai kiungwa na sana wana yesu ya sifiwe so as we are thinking, as we are talking about this, I'm saying all this so that we begin to capture even those that will be helping us to do whatever we do, whether in terms of ministry, in terms of structures, in terms of facilities, that we'll need really to apply a lot of thought. We need very intelligent designs or intelligently done designs and uh, even the execution of what we do because wisdom is really the thing that will help us to build structures, to build our lives, to build our relationships, to build our ministry, wisdom. Then number two thing that we see the Queen of Sheba seeing is the supplies. The Bible is talking about the food on the table. And the Queen of Sheba was able to notice very well about the supplies on the king's table. And I believe that she was able to see that on the table of Solomon, there was constant chain of supply of the food. There are some places you go and uh, unakuta, you have been invited into the table, lakini unakuta vitu hazijaka vizuri, but for, but, but for Solomon, he had a very, very good intelligently organized supply of things. And wisdom is the, the one that really gives you the ability to keep the constant supply of the, the resources that you need in an organization. Supply of money, supply of petty cash, supply of stationaries in an office. You can go to some of the government offices, Nakuta, even to get a pin or a full scalp is a challenge. Supply of equipment when they are needed. Whatever you need, need to be supplied. Sometimes you go to some organizations, even very high organizations, like international airports. toilet paper. from corner to corner. And definitely you build toilets because you know what you want to toilet. And when you don't put the toilet papers, what, do you, what are you telling us? But you see, many a time you'll find that people have a poverty, scarcity mentality. Na kwa sababu yu unakuta toilets like here. From the time we opened the church here, I cannot stand any staff member kukuta show hazina toilet. Hazina toilet paper. How? Why? Kwa nini mtoto wa edea jisaidia hapo na unajua mtoto wata haangali yangi kama kuna tishu? Yehi ataanza kuangalia tishu wakati anahitaji kuitumia. Alafu unakuta sasa yehi anafanya na kidole hivu anaweka kwa ukuta. Sasa, which is easy to put a toilet paper there or to clean the wall. 
ni we mwenye ujiambie. <laughs> I cannot stand stuff going to a toilet in church na nikuta kuna hata moja hata ni every time I'm funny akinkienda hata ni kama ninaenda tu kunawa mikono huko I must check whether every toilet unless ile iko na mtu kwamba are there toilet papers In fact kama hata leo asubuhi nilienda tu nikakuta tu gine tuko karibu kuisha na mimi sasa mi mimi na kuanga na shida pastor Ben vitu zingine siwezi siwezi nikaita Kevin Kevin embe uende uwabie hao jamaa uweke toilet paper huko kwa sababu zimebaki kidogo before long mtu mmoja atakuja atumie wakati ule nilimaliza for service and i knew sasa break dio inakuja sasa watu wataanza ku flock na mtu amekubali yache ibaki kidogo so we are talking about building supply system in your office if we came what we do would we see then number three thing that uh, I, i need to rush now the third thing that uh, the, the queen of sheba saw was a sitting arrangement of the officials of solomon these guys i must have sat very well in a way in order of seniority in in a order of chain of command and this lady ukisikia hewa inapotea kule mwisho si kitu moja aliona but she saw the subtotal of everything and when you're talking about sitting arrangement it also could stand for the staging the presentation of how things are presented the ability to present what you have prepared and for you to present and to stage something well like a preaching like what i'm doing now it requires preparation now what i'm doing here now this is staging i'm presenting something that i prepared for the, for the last several days and how you present it how you stage whatever you are prepared then it will show your wisdom and your preparedness and that is why we require that people are supposed to prepare rehearse for many days have you ever seen for instance like now we shall be having the madaraka day at kisumu the army and the armed forces have been on that ground preparing and being drilled for days and days and days when they will stage that walk or marching the way they will be marching unakuta mguu wa mtu mmoja watu 100 mguu ya yule ya kopando ile 100 people from here na wa huyo mguu ikienda moja zote you only see as if it is one leg it is because people have worked to prepare but the problem is you come to churches and people are not prepared you go to Sunday school sometimes and you find the teachers are not prepared You go to the youth service. Unakuta wakati tuko na ibada hapa tunaendelea ndio naona Kevin anakuja kusugumzia one of my pastors. Sasa Joe tusugumzie kwa sababu hiyo ina crisis. Mhubiri hajakuja. Swali ni ulimuita jana. Asubuhi uliconfirm anakuja. That minutes before the service begins, did you confirm and reconfirm that anakuja? Mhm. Kevin sorry I'm picking on you as an example but it is not just you it happens in Sunday school watoto wako huko mwalimu hakuna somebody has to be picked who was not prepared the man has met kuna crisis ama he but when you you prepare well then you find that everything comes out well even it is the praise and worship they meet several times to prepare But now we are saying that now moving forward we want to see better staging better presentation of our sermons better presentation of our teachings better presentation of our praise and worship and everything because we are saying we want to upgrade and then the other thing that we see are the services we could call them services we see the serving by the solomon's waiters they seem to be very ready and very prompt to serve and queen of sheba is just there she is eating but she is observing what is happening how prompt are they how ready are they in church on sunday how prepared are we for everything that happens 
Are we prepared for people as they come to church? Are the archers ready? Are the security ready? Are the Sunday school teachers ready? Are the pastors ready? Is everybody ready for what is happening? And this happens even in businesses. Unaguta, you want to do, you want to give somebody business, but they don't seem to be ready. Recently, we traveled to Eldoret with my wife. And we left this place very early in the morning. We flew to Eldoret Airport. And there we are. We picked our taxi. And we had to pass through town to take breakfast. And we asked the guy, which is the best hotel you know around, which we could, we could have breakfast. To Nagia Hotel. Atahuoni mutu kwa rumu yote, the, the whole place. Tunakada kikabili, tatu, nene tunambiana. Sasa, what are we doing here? Hakuna mutu, tulikuta tu mutu wa security huko, lakini hapa hakuna mutu. We want to give them business, we want to give them money. But they are not ready. How many times do you think we miss getting business or getting church members simply because Somebody comes to church in a kuangalia na kuona, how are to mean again? Nobody is concerned. Nobody is interested with me. Sometimes to nabia watu atuwe sadaka. Ata atuja project the, the, the pay bill number. Namutu akona na pesa, nathaku tupatia sadaka, but we are not ready. Somebody comes to your business and finds here. You don't seem to be ready. Or sometimes you go to hotels and you must really look for a waiter. We, 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 eh? And you're wondering, what is wrong? But for Solomon, he had very good service systems. Number five, as I go to finish, security systems. The Queen of Sheba looked at the couple bearers the security systems of Solomon that were so efficient. The campaigners during those times were the people that were ensuring that there the was security of the food of the king. Because those days there were no guns, there were no bombs. So the, 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 what they used to do most if they wanted to remove a king is just to poison them. There were no good hospitals. So once you poison someone, most likely they will just die. And so they had to be good cup bearers. And the queen of Sheba, the Bible is saying, she looked and looked at the whole thing and she was able to see that she felt safe. And then the other one, as I uh, close to finish, is the style. There was the apparel of Solomon's servants. The style of everything that was done, including how they, 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 they were dressed. Servants were very well adorned with very good looking apparels and, uh, and all that. They were dressed very well before the king. They would not just come before the king just with anything. There was a lot of respect and honor. They came dressed for the occasion. And I was just thinking that it is the high time if we want to upgrade our our services and our, our meetings, is the high time we begin to pay more attention on how we dress. Because sometimes if you come to church and uh, a visitor comes or even anybody is wondering, are these people ready for the church? In your own view, you prepared for church in a good way. <clears throat> I don't know how, what it means to prepare for church, but uh, just look in your own judgment. Francis, umeona wangapi around there? Derek, umeona watu usim? We are left, alikuwa ready. Na yule behind. Brethren, if we, our church will grow, we'll need now to take the work of God more seriously that the leaders especially will set a good example to the rest of the church that we shall be coming like people who seem to be ready before God. Because sometimes you will wonder why 
Could we be very smart when we are going to the office because of our bosses and our customers? And when we are coming to God, we come like people who are not ready. We need to pay more attention on how we dress. And this is one of the things that we shall be discussing a lot in the course of this training. And so, when you're thinking about style, it is always good even to think about the color scheme of what you do. What you do. For instance, if you are to be asked, how is our color scheme as, as Pefas Yokimao? Do we seem to have like a corporate color? Even Bill Ata Kuulizo, Ukiangaliangalia tu, Uangalia tu, Unaonaji? Hmm? My wife and I say, no, I thought, for instance, you see, Pefa, Pefa, normally we use blue. While you may not paint everything blue, you may seem very boring. So, we must to break kidogo kidogo. So, most of our colors here are blue, very deliberately. But we cannot have blue, blue, naviti blue, floor blue. So, you must break a little bit. But when somebody looks, they can say there is a color scheme to add blue. When we came from the first day, we bought ivory color shares. And the person I have never allowed any other color except for the small children who need assortment of colors. And when you look at this, I guess somebody can see this looks a bit professional. Kofia near red, tie near green, coat near brown, socks near white, trousers. <laughs> we must think a little bit. And that is why, like in our church, if somebody wanted to donate something, we request them, don't buy anything for us before you have consulted. So that we agree and we advise you on what to buy. So, style is very, very important. So, moving forward, we shall begin to pay a little bit more attention to how we dress. Uh, and the boot camp mentorship program will help us to do this. The last one that she saw was spirituality of Solomon. She was able to see, you see, for somebody who knows how the Jews would go and how kings would go from the palace, like David, the way they would move from the palace to the temple or to the place of worship. During David's time, the temple was not yet there, but there was the, te the, the tent. It was called the ascent to the temple. That's why like when you go to the book of Psalms, you'll see many Psalms that are written as Psalms of ascent. Those are the Psalms, the songs they would sing as they were approaching the presence of God. Uh, sometimes they would sing them when they are coming from distant places as they walk towards Jerusalem. And now, but now for, for, for Solomon, the temple and the palace were not very far away from each other. But the queen of Sheba was able to observe. She had been asking her so many questions. She had observed all the excellence that was there. And she was wondering, how did this guy get all this wisdom? But there is a way in which it seems that the climax of the whole of what she saw was the ascent of Solomon after the banquet, him now moving together with the Levites and the people that were escorting him to go to the temple and to begin to worship and to offer the sacrifices. She was able to see the honor, the reverence with which Solomon, without shame, he would go to the house of the Lord before another queen and to worship God. And the Bible says that when this happened, this woman was lost of spirit. She was overwhelmed. And I want to believe she was able to see or to understand 
that all this excellence she has been seeing, it was connected with the relationship that Solomon had with his God. She was able to know that all what we've been seeing is a result of the relationship that God had with Solomon. These were all the blessings that God had given this man. And so, we want to have this training so that we can be able to see together with the church workers how best can we be able then to serve God with that dedication that Solomon had, with that kind of a commitment, with that kind of level of excellence, with that kind of level of deliberateness in what she was doing, all that Solomon had done, and she was able to see. We want to see devotion and commitment. Unfortunately, we find many people who commit themselves to everything else. They are committed to their jobs. They are committed to their businesses, to their families, and to almost everything. But when you come to the house of God, you find people that are not committed. But now, is that is what we want to see. As we upgrade our standards on what we do, and, uh, and all that. And I know that the Lord will bless us and bless us in a big way if we do that. So that marks the end of uh, what I wanted to share. But maybe just a few things that I would want to mention is that uh, before we go, we shall give you some pieces of paper so that you can indicate if you'd want to join this program. Those that would want to join this program, I would want you to give us your names. And also, very importantly, we want to know when could we be meeting. My proposal is that we be meeting once per month with the people that are interested. And I would want you to tell us which day would you want us? I would wish that we'd be having like one and a half hours to two hours every month. But during the month, we shall have given ourselves some assignments to do. But every month, we meet about one and a half hours or two hours. And what I've been maybe contemplating in my mind, the times that we could meet, probably, for instance, we could meet one Sunday morning per month. Where we would say, the first Sunday of the month, as an example, we meet at 7, and by 8.30 we are done. Or we can say, a Sunday, one Sunday of the month, after second service. And we meet for one, one and a half hours to two hours, just the way we have done today. Or we could, for reason say, we meet every Tuesday, a working day, at 6 in the evening, to about 7.30 to 8. So, as you write your name to show commitment, if you are not, if you don't want to join, please don't feel. Those who want to join, please fill your name and your contacts, your full name and your contacts, and then you indicate what would be your preference in terms of uh, the day. Is it a Sunday morning at 7? Is it a Sunday afternoon at 2 to about 3.30? Or is it a weekday, uh, as an example, Tuesday at 6 to about 7.30? So I hope my instructions are... So those who will show interest when you come, the first day when you come, we shall be giving you the uh, star, uh, rather the, the, the study areas, the modules that we shall be having. We shall give you more details on that. And then for those who will be joining, we shall form a WhatsApp group where we shall be giving you more communication. So you'll allow us to include you in a WhatsApp group. But because what, what some groups, the Mekua Mingi Sana, with a lot of sometimes unnecessary information, maybe this one would make it a one-sided thing where we only pass information to the people and the people cannot 
the, the other members cannot be able to send any information. Uh, and if they have anything to say, then they side, uh, they side shut the leaders, the people that we, we shall have, uh, we shall appoint. Maybe a, a class rep will be sending us most of the communications and all that. And uh, yeah, we shall be having quite a bit of uh, assignments uh, every other time, and I know it will be well. I hope that I have not forgotten anything. So tell us the day and the time that you prefer, whether a Sunday morning or a Sunday afternoon or a weekday. And if it is a weekday, maybe a Tuesday. Yeah. So I think I am done. I can, you can allow me to pray. But then after prayers, if there be any question, I can be able to answer very quickly. Let us pray as we come to the end. Our Father and our God, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you so much today. Thank you for enabling us to have this session today and even to discuss on how to begin uh, the, 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 the mentorship program. Lord, may you enable us to come up with a, with a suitable day when all of us can be available. And Father, may we have many people who will commit themselves so that, Father, we can prepare ourselves as we build capacity in us and even in the church so that, Father, we can be able to tap into the blessing and the promises that, Lord, you have given us. Thank you for all the members that I have attended today. Lord, we pray for a special blessing upon them. Thank you for those who had given the apologies, Lord. We pray that, Father, when this video goes and finds them, O oh Lord, it shall be a blessing to them. We want to thank you, Father, and to worship you for all things. Receive honor and glory in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So that marks the end of uh, what we are uh, taking video. But if there be any quick uh, question or any clarification, I think I can still do that. But uh, meanwhile, we can have a mume adika. Kuna mtu anakosa kalamu? Please ask your neighbor if you don't have a pen. Uh, yeah, but we do want to pick the papers. Uh, yeah, let the ushers help us. The name and the time and the day. Make sure you have the full name, the contact, the day you prefer, and the time you prefer. Is there any... I'm feeling Pastor Ben.